Hey, well, this morning we're continuing our series on spiritual formation. And we've been talking about what causes us to grow. We've been talking about different aspects of the human personality and how there's different aspects of our spiritual formation. I want to take this week and next week to wrap up the series and talk about what have traditionally been called spiritual disciplines. Personally, I use different words than that because when I think of discipline, I think of really tough football workouts, uh, you know, doing homework, being disciplined by my parents, something like that. Nothing very exciting. You know, the words that are being used now are like spiritual practices. I like that. Or how about this? Habits of the soul. So today we're going to talk about some habits of the soul. Because when when you think of it just as something that's a discipline, we miss the beauty and the goodness of it. Spiritual practices are not meant to wear us out. They are meant to re-energize us. I know for me, when I was told all the things I needed to do growing up in junior high and high school as a Christian, all the disciplines, it got discouraging and it just seemed to create a lot of guilt. So the things that we're talking about today and next week are not there to create guilt. They're to create you know, beauty in your life and something good that's happening. But I know for me, for example, uh, we were told to memorize a lot of Bible verses, which is good. We were told to read the Bible a lot. I knew we were supposed to do that. Uh, Dallas Willard, who's maybe the greatest thing from the last 50 years on spiritual formation, says quiet time has been used more to create guilt in Christians' lives than anything else. And that's how it was for me. I remember I, was, I had a, a friend who was a high school pastor, and he said that one of his high school seniors, every time he saw him on a Wednesday or a Sunday, would say, hey, did you do your quiet time this morning? And I was like, who does that? And then I was sitting next to a friend of mine in junior high school. We're in church, and he's madly reading the Bible during church. And I was like, what are you reading? Why are you reading? You know, what's going on? He says, well, I've committed to read five chapters a day. His name's Timmy. He's just reading. Like I said, but your dad's preaching right now. His dad's preaching, and he's doing his quiet time so that he doesn't feel the guilt. My parents even bought me. This isn't the one they bought me. I lost it a long time ago. But they bought me a journal when I turned 11 or 12. And I didn't know what to do with a journal. I just felt really guilty when I didn't write in it. So I try to write meaningful things like, God, help me score a goal this Saturday. Things like that. God, I really need a dirt bike. Really, really, really need a Honda 70 dirt bike. Uh, God, uh, help Cheryl Emerson to notice me. She's so hot. You know, things like that. That's... What are you going to write at 12? We hope to look at them differently this Sunday and some of the spiritual practices we're going to talk about. I said we had five life areas that we've been talking about the last five weeks. I want to give you some very tangible, practical tools to help you develop and grow in these areas. There could be five next to each of these. We talked about the emotional component of our faith, our physical component. There's a relational, an ethical, an intellectual component. And there's several disciplines that could go with each of those. I've just chosen one. So this week we're going to talk about worship and rest. And maybe you've never thought about the connection between worship and rest on Sunday, but today we're going to look at that. We have on your seat, I'm looking for mine, I've got just the bottom half of it. Everyone take this piece of paper out. Can I borrow this one right here? And all right, so pull this out. It looks like a bookmark, but something surprising is hidden in this bookmark. So if you tear it here at the bottom, there's, some dot, there's a dotted line. If you tear it there and you plant it in a cup with dirt, and I think it needs water and sunshine, something will grow. This paper is filled with seeds. It sounds crazy. And we chose it because my favorite metaphor for the spiritual practices, the habits of the soul is that they are seeds that we plant. Think about that. You plant them, and then the Spirit of God grows something good and beautiful in your life. And so take this, plant it with your kids or by yourself, or have someone in your office plant it with you on their desk. It'll be really awkward and weird, but awesome. And then water it, and you're, you know, tear it off here, and then, and then something's going to grow. And... and uh, as you think about that growing thing, that God is also at the same time growing something in your soul. So we're going to start in Psalm 95. 
and I want to start at verse 1. As Because when I think about Sundays, when I think about the things that happen during the week, on Sundays, and I have this statement, on Sundays, I get to worship. On Sundays, I get to worship. So Psalm 95, verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol, extol, exalt him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his, hand, and his hands formed the dry land. Verse 6, come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not Harden your heart. And so we have this beautiful psalm on worship and why it's so good for the soul to worship. And so I want to start with this deep theological question that theologians have been wrestling with for years. It goes like this. So why is coming to church to worship corporately better than staying home and making banana pancakes with the kids? So that's, that's the deep theological question we're going to start with. But it really is a very practical question because we make a value choice every time we choose to worship, whether it's privately or publicly, or choose not to. There's, there's a battle, kind of a war for our worship. There are some people who chose this morning that something else was more important than worship, and so they're not here. We're not judging them at all, by the way. I, we're not going to mention names or anything or take attendance. But do you see, so I've heard this definition, it's maybe it's my favorite definition of worship. Worship is about expressing value about something we love the most. That whatever we love most captures our worship. And sometimes we choose something to be more important than worship. So uh, when we worship God, we're saying that he's more important than anything else in our entire lives. So I have this key idea on the screen, and and it's a take-home. I hope you can remember. Worship is why God made you. It's central to the Christian life and necessary for a meaningful relationship with God. Sometimes we think we can live without worship and rest, but your soul will shrivel, and you will miss out because he wants to grow you in so many good and beautiful ways through worship. There's a writer on worship, his name is John Frame, and he writes this about the importance and how critical it is to the, to the human soul, to the Christian soul. John Frame writes, in one sense, worship is the whole point of everything. It's the purpose of history, the goal of the whole Christian story. Worship is not just one segment of the Christian life among others. Worship is the entire Christian life. So your your soul longs for worship, and when we worship, we express value and love for God, that we value and treasure Him more than anything else. There are several critical things, reasons why we worship. I I have them on the screen. I want to talk through them briefly. The first thing is I would say this, that worship brings has this way of bringing people back to God. When we gather to worship, something happens in our soul, and our soul comes back to God. David used to write about this, and he has so much on worship. He says in Psalm 122, 1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. When I say that worship brings us back to God, my favorite worship bringing someone back to God's story comes from Cuba. I was in Cuba years ago with college students, a basketball team, and we During the day, we played the Cuban Olympic team in different venues. At night, my college students would speak in different churches, and I would speak. And we were staying at this hotel in in Santiago de Cuba, a small hotel by the beach that the Cuban Olympic Federation put us in. And it had a restaurant there, and in the restaurant was a band, just a small hotel band. And the first time I'm in there, I hear them play Girl from Iponema. It's my favorite Brazilian song ever. Um, Maybe you've heard of it. doesn't matter. And so I went right over. I gave everyone in the band a dollar. You know, hey, that was good. And so as I'm leaving uh, lunch that day, they they break out and girl from Iponema again. So I go back and give everybody a dollar. 
What I didn't know, now that was Monday, the rest of the week, every time I walked through the doors of the restaurant, boom, girl from Ipanema would, would break out. Everyone gets a dollar. And then on my way out, just to remind me, to kick in again. And it, it was great all week long. And we got to know the lead musician. His name was Bobby. He spoke some English. And we kept saying, Bobby, come, come tonight to church with us. We're in a different church every night. And he'd say, church? I don't even know what happens at church. You know, he would have a cerveza and a couple of girls hanging around him. He wasn't the kind of guy that went to church in Cuba. He just wasn't. But the last night we're there is a Saturday night. I get up to speak, and I see the whole band sitting together. And I was like, that's awesome. And then one of my players gave Bobby a Bible and a pair of shoes. And I didn't think much about that, but then I, we came back a year later. This time I brought a band. And we went stri- that first night we went to Elmer Labastida's church where Bobby had been. I'm there, the, the auditorium's filling, and then I see someone rushing down the aisle toward me with his arms open, and I go, Bobby, what are you doing in church? And he says, he got to me, and he gave me this huge hug, and he says, this is my church. I said, this is your church? And I turned to the pastor, and Elmer Labastida says, he hasn't missed a Sunday since you left since that first night. And then he says, yes. And he says, I was baptized. And then he said, here's my wife, his wife and his two daughters. He said, they were just baptized last week. So one man comes to worship and God grabs his soul. And now there's a whole family worshiping God. Do you see why I say that worship has this way of bringing us back to God? And and Maybe you haven't been away from God for years. Maybe it's just been a really rough last six days. And I always look forward to Sundays because some weeks are harder than others. But I know that when I get here to worship with you, everything changes. If your heart, maybe it's been not six days, maybe it's been six months that your heart has been far from God. When you come here on Sundays, it has a way of bringing us back to him, doesn't it? The soul longs to worship. Now, we can worship in private. I think there's something very powerful that happens when we worship here together. A worship I have next changes the way I see my life's troubles and my life's problems. Have you noticed that? It's like it's kind of like getting on an airplane, especially like a 747. Have you ever lifted off from Sky Harbor? And maybe you're going to Tokyo or London. And, and you look down and the cars are like ants from 35,000 feet. And all of a sudden your problems feel that big too. And just a few hours earlier, you know, the person in the cubicle next to you was creating a nightmare about your report. And you thought it was the biggest thing in the world. And now it means nothing. And all of your troubles seem to melt away. Some, for some reason, getting on a plane does that. I think in the same way, when we come and we worship, it puts all of our trouble in right size because we realize God has his arms around all of it and nothing's too big for him. Uh, when I come to worship, here's what else happens. Worship reconnects me with God's people. I love our space in the round, and one of my, the, my favorite reasons for liking our space in the round is that you get to see people's faces when you worship, not just the back of their heads. And, and, and we're reminded that we're not in this pursuit of God alone. Sometimes during the week, it feels like I'm out there by myself, but when you're here on Sundays worshiping, it reminds you you're not alone. You can worship alone, it's just not as good. You can go bowling alone, it's just not as good. You know, you can go to a football game alone and feel like a loser, it's just not as good. There were actually Christians back around 400 AD that climbed pillars in Roman cities and they would sit there for days months, years, and they would lower a bucket. They're called pillar saints. And they would say, we're just up here worshiping God all day long. And they would lower buckets for food and water. And they would stay there for months saying, we're, we're, now you can worship, but it's not so good. After a few hours, it gets pretty lonely up there at the top. But that's what they did. Some of them even for years. But God created us to thrive in the presence of other people when we worship together. Worship also has a way of restoring my soul. It does. If I go back to Psalm 23, so go back to Psalms where we started and then turn to the famous Psalm 23, and we read, The Lord is my shepherd, 
I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. The NIV says, he refreshes my soul. I like that language. Worship has this way of reorientating us, re renewing the soul. If your soul feels drained and tired, and the soul gets tired in a different way than our body gets tired in a different way than our mind gets tired, the soul gets tired. And so that leads me to a second practice that I want to I want to challenge you with today. I said that on Sundays I get to worship, on Sundays I get to rest. And those two disciplines I think go together. We read this about Jesus. This is Luke chapter 5. Listen to these words. It's from the Message Bible I have here. As often as possible, Jesus withdrew to out-of-the-way places for prayer. How do you like that? Jesus would withdraw because he would get so frazzled from the people around him, from the work of the day and from, from walking, he would withdraw to out-of-the-way places. He would climb a mountain sometimes. He would go in a garden. He would go out on a boat. He would go to out-of-the-way places. I say that because the soul craves rest. And maybe you've never thought about that spiritual practice because maybe it seems too easy because the soul craves rest. There's a, there's a beautiful, rich Hebrew word that encapsulates this idea. It's the, the word selah. Selah is used about 71 times in the Psalms. Selah in Hebrew means to rest. It means to pause. It can mean stop and listen. How do you like that? Or pause and think about that. That's what Selah means. For the Hebrew people, they knew that Sabbath was the day to Selah. Sabbath, their, their Sabbath day was their day to rest. Now, the problem with rest and with Sabbath is a whole lot of legalism grew up around it. For the Hebrew people, even the rabbis and the priests wrote something called the Talmud. And the Talmud is filled, this thick volume of regulation and rules, many of them having to do with the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, a Jewish person was not allowed to move a chair in their house because the floors were dirt. And if you dragged the chair, you might create a furrow and you were farming and working. Uh, on the Sabbath, the Talmud said you could not look in a mirror because if you looked in a mirror, you might see your hair was out of place and you go to fix it and you'd be doing the work of a beautician. So you kind of do that. On the Sabbath, if somebody was really critically sick, let's say, or hurt, let's say they got hit by a car, you could keep, you could keep them alive, but you couldn't help them get any better. That's all you could do because otherwise you'd be doing the work of a doctor. It's just got to be ridiculous. And so I grew up in a culture that I knew Sunday was a day of rest, but I lived in Mississippi for a while as a kid, and there were, there were even blue laws down there, things you can't do on Sunday. And my family observed things like on Sunday, we were banned from shopping, from movies. We couldn't go to the mall. And we say, why can't we go shopping? And they say, well, you're going to make other people work. But we could play Monopoly, the game of capitalism and you know, greed and materialism, but we could play Monopoly. We were banned. My brother and I were punished once for, don't tell my parents this. This is inside stuff. Uh, but we were banned from throwing the baseball on Sunday, but we could watch football, especially if the Cowboys were playing. Then it was all very spiritual. And so we have all of these confusing regulations, and God made this day and made this practice for the soul to rest. Experts have established that the body is on this rhythm where it has to rest. In fact, extensive studies have been done. One that I read recently was done at the UCLA Center for Families. And they did this extensive 5,500 person survey over several years, spending thousands of dollars. Here's some of their findings. They said they found that, when, and, and by the way, the goal of the study was to determine how do women and men recover from workplace stress differently. And they found this. When women come home and are alone, they do housework. Okay. When men come home after work, a stressful day, and are alone, they put their feet up and relax. It's also shocking. You know, it took thousands of people to discover that. Here's some more findings from the study. Women feel their stress and anxiety levels drop when their husbands help them with household chores, like doing the dishes or, or helping the kids with their homework. No surprise there. Men feel their stress and anxiety levels drop 
when their wives do the household chores <laughs> and they are able to relax undisturbed in a separate room. You know, that's, I would have never, ever figured that out on my own. <laughs> By the way, I'm not endorsing this study at all. I'm just reading the facts. The, the professor of psychiatry who led this study, he says, it appears men recover from stress best when they are least involved in household chores. Hmm, who knew? You know, who knew that? <laughs> John Ortberg, you know, this great writer, speaker, pastor, he's talking about giving his kids a bath once, and his wife had asked him to help, and so he's in the bathroom making sure they don't drown, and she comes and she whispers in his ear. She says, when you give the kids a bath, I feel very attracted to you. He said, I started giving them baths like four times a day, you know, <laughs> whether they were dirty or we're, we're taking a bath right now. He was highly motivated after that. <laughs> My point is, the soul craves that kind of rest. There's a rest for our bodies. There's a rest for our minds. But there's a rest for the soul. And, and, and the Bible keeps talking about this. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. We read this. There remains a Sabbath rest for people, for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their own work, just as God did from his. If we go all the way back to the book of Exodus, we read these famous words in Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall work and do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath. It is a rest day and worship for the Lord our God. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in it, but he rested on the seventh day, and he made it holy. So do you see there's this beautiful rhythm that God created of work and busyness and then rest. To rest is actually a way to honor and bring glory to God and focus on him. Six days, he says, you can be busy. Listen to Matthew eleven twenty eight. This is These are some of my favorite words from Jesus. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then he says, because my yoke is easy. Easy is a soul word from Jesus, isn't it? It's, sometimes we get caught up in the busyness and the pace of life, and we're, we're, we're rushing from work to things with our kids, and then we're rushing to meet friends, and it feels like the world is buzzing Sabbath, our Sundays, and it can be whatever day your Sabbath is. But we have this day set aside to worship and to rest because there's a fatigue of the soul that just sleeping won't solve. And on Sundays, we get to rest. And, and so one of my invitations to you is to slow down. I, has anyone ever given you permission to rest? Have you ever had a boss? You know, there's something really that needs to be done at, at work, and it's really hard. And he says to you, you know what? You have been working so hard today. Just rest. It doesn't happen often, but it's a, it's a great thing. Have you had your husband or your wife say, you know, I know that you're stressed out. Just rest. I'll take care of it. If you had a friend say, you need to move. I know you're moving. You just rest and I'll move for you. That actually doesn't happen, but it would be awesome. And so there's, but as Americans, we, we feel the more busy we are, the more important we are. And we, when, when someone say, how's your day going or your week or your, or your work going? We always say, oh, I'm busy because that means we're more important. And Jesus says, rest, rest your soul. It's a learned ability. There's a well-known writer in the early 20th century, her name was, is, or she's not alive anymore, Letty Kalman. And Letty had traveled to Africa, and she was visiting some missionaries there who were deep in the bush. And this was way back in the early 20th century when you still needed to hire porters to walk the trails and carry your things. And she wanted to get there quickly like all Americans do. So she told the porters, we've got to make good time today. And so all day they're walking fast and they've got big loads and they went far and the sun finally sets and they make camp and she's proud of the progress. She feels this great accomplishment, she says, for what she got done in one day. The next morning she gets up early and all of her porters are sitting around the fire and she comes up to them, okay, it's time to go, you know, andale, mas rapido, I don't know what you say, whatever, in Swahili. And she's like, they're like, 
the lead porter got up and he says, Mrs. Cowman, yesterday we walked very far. We walked very fast and very far. And she said, uh, you know, we walk so far that our bodies are here, but we've left our souls behind. And so today, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. <laughs> it's so true. And maybe you're here today, and your soul needs to catch up to your body. Maybe you've been trying so hard at work, so hard to keep up, so busy that you come here and you're just exhausted. So today, find rest. That's my invitation. That's the invitation in Scripture over and over. That's one of the great reasons we come to worship on Sundays. I, I want to end this morning with a practical, a very practical invitation. I said that today we come and we worship and we rest. And I want to share or challenge you and invite you to the habit of kneeling. Maybe it's been Maybe it's been years since you kneeled at home, let alone in public like this, but today I'm going to invite you to kneel. In, uh, in the Bible, we read of people meeting God. I'll start with David in Psalm 95, verse 6. He says, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our Maker. Here's what we also read in the Psalms. In the Psalms, in Psalm 46, 10, we read this great line, Be still and know that I am God. Listen to how it reads in different translations. See striving and know that I am God. Stand silent and know that I am God. The Amplified Bible, let be and be still and know, recognize, understand that I am God. Stop fighting, he says, and know that I am God. The Message Bible, which is a paraphrase, says, Step out of the traffic, take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics and everything else, and know that I am God. If you haven't kneeled before, as I said in the Bible, David kneeled. We read that Moses, when he met God in Exodus, he dro Exodus 3, he drops face down on the ground and he worships. Ezekiel, we read in, in 128, when I saw the Lord, I fell face down. Daniel 10, 15. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face down toward the ground. David says in, in 1 Chronicles 29, David and the elders were closed in sackcloth and fell face down. Saul in Acts chapter 9, when he when, he, when God spoke to him, we read he fell face down. We have all of these acts of kneeling and meeting God face down. I thought about this when I kneel. When I kneel, for example, and pray, it's no longer about me, is it? Uh, when I kneel and pray, and pray, if I kneel at any time in life, I'm no longer in charge. When I kneel, I can't hurry or rush anymore. When I kneel, I can't tell other people what to do. When I kneel in prayer, I finally see God. And maybe you arrived here this morning, and maybe even it was a busy morning getting here. But now hopefully your soul has found some peace and rest. Mm -hmm.